in depressed sternum. Patient one has tightness of the anterior chest wall. Okay? Patient one not only rounded shoulders posture, but also forward head. We'll get to that when we get to the neck. So we want to start by releasing what's tight anteriorly before we start to mobilize what's stiff posteriorly and eventually work on strength training in the posterior aspect. So one of the first things I'd like to do is this four M's release of the thoracic inlet. We did this in massage, remember? One hand under the CT junction, the other hand over the thoracic inlet. Remember the thoracic inlet is the superior opening of the thoracic cavity. There's some confusion here, but correctly speaking, this is the inlet for what? What comes into the thoracic cavity through this superior opening? We have right, all the major vessels right, of the thoracic cavity, the aorta. We have the brachiocephalic, the subclavian. We've got the esophagus, the trachea. We've got all our major lymphatic vessels coming into this area. We've got what neurologic structures coming in through here? We've got the, what innervates the diaphragm? Phrenic nerve, right. We have the 10th cranial nerve, which is the vagus nerve. We have the sympathetic chain. We've got a lot of action coming in here. We've got major uh, vascular vessels. We've got major uh, neural structures coming in through here. We've got lymphatic structures coming. There's a lot happening in through this very small, relatively small opening. And then we have all these mechanical influences. We've got the pec major, the pec minor. <coughs> We've got the clavi pectoral fascia coming into the superficial cervical fascia. We've got the transversus thoracic muscle coming in here and depressing the ribs, right? You know about that? We've got a lot happening right here. So we want to free this area up and open it up. Yeah? Also the three birds that live in the thoracic cave. Three what? Birds, the esophagus, the vagus, and the thoracic duct. He has a goose too, but that's the goose. One more time. Three birds. The esophagus. Esophagus. The vagus. And the thoracic duct. So, need I say more? We want to soften, release the I gave you a little acronym to, to work on last year. It was called SLOW, remember? So overall, slow is good to slow down breathing, slow down um, heart rate, slow down metabolism, metabolic rate, just to kind of get the person into a, a slower type of uh, state, a more relaxed state. And then each letter, S for soften and smooth, L for lengthen and loosen, O for open, and W for warm. Good. So we have mold, meld, monitor, and move. Mold, anatomy to anatomy. Meld, physiology to physiology. Monitor, indirect or direct. And move, indirect or <coughs> direct. This one, you can really think about the art form of manual therapy when you get to this point. You shift from your left brain to your right, and you really just think about achieving those effects we talked about, not explaining them, not necessarily being able to understand them, just feeling and just going with it. So it's more of an art at this point based on science. I like to always start indirect. I like to cooperate with the body. I feel if I cooperate with the body, it'll cooperate with me. It's kind of like making a deal. If I go where the body wants to go, then eventually, okay, now it's my turn. Now you come back here because you need to be stretched. So I go indirect, and I just follow the stream. I follow the inherent motion. And you use your imagination. I used to make this the five M's, but when I wrote the book, I didn't want to take away from the person, Peter Fabian from San Francisco, who came up with the four M's. I didn't want to undermine that, so I went back to the four. But for a while, I was teaching the five, and the fifth M was magnified. And that's where you turn up the power of the microscope. So mold, meld, monitor, magnify. So make this very small movement a very big movement. So use your imagination a little bit. And you 
just let the area unwind. That's the indirect. Direct is the shear clock. With the two hands, I go around the clock looking for restriction. And I try to find out where he's not free, where he's not moving, and then I stretch. Any direction around the clock. Stool works nice here because I can move in different directions. And it's nice to do this technique sitting as well. Because sitting you have you have uh, three-dimensional access. I can come in here, and I can now really move around the body. I can change hands wherever I need to go. Just free up this area of the inlet. So circulation, lymphatic reuptake, nice neurologic effects, nice mechanical and postural effects. I can do a necklace technique. I can get my hands like a necklace and through here. And I can come forward on the left, back on the right, forward on the right, back on the left, and release the inlet that way. Just, I can start with an indirect approach. This feels free. This feels tight. So I'm going to start with free. Just kind of go with the flow. Let it unwind. And then come back when he's tight. Okay. So ease, indirect, bind, direct. All kinds of things. You can go right, you can go left. Just get this area to open up myofascially. All right, on your back again. Right there. From there, we do all the strumming. Uh, we do muscle play, we do steamroll. This would be more direct fascial techniques. Remember, I start in the uh, loosened part of the range, and I check the uh, play of the pec major. I get my strumming contacts together, three and three, middle fin uh, index fingers and thumbs out of the way, and I look for taut bands. I just search around the area, I put them into a more lengthened part of the range, and I look for something that's tight, trigger points, stringy, ropey, thick, dense tissue, and again, soften, smooth. Loosen, lengthen, open, and warm. I showed you last year the um, major coming over, the minor underneath, getting into that little tunnel in through there, and trying to free up the minor, attaching into three, four, and five. Make sure your nails are cut for this. Are they seeing that? Major, over, underneath. Got to make sure you choose your patient. Not everybody can tolerate this. Subscapularis, we came in on the ventral surface of the scapula, then brought him into the lengthen range. Separate the subscapularis from the serratus, they get down together. Andres has a technique he showed us last year. Did you show them the ART in the massage? Yeah. So we're gonna, he's going to show you some more now in practice. Subscapularis. What else can we do? On your side, face that way for us. This one I love, really nice stretch. Make sure you protect the, the glomerulomeral joint. You don't want it becoming anteriorly subluxed. Wind it up, externally rotate it. Bring them back. Then I have my muscle play, my strum. I can do my myofascial. I can look for restriction, direct technique. I can do post-isometric relaxation. Bring your arm down and in against me, ready, go. One, two, three, four, five, relax, relax, let it go, and stretch. Open, open this whole area up, it's really important, okay? Good. <clears throat> okay, Andres, you want to show us a couple of things on the chest wall? Remember, for all these techniques, a little bit of deep breath, a little bit of With ART, uh, we did ART last, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so just to run over real quick, what do you do in ART? Uh, the steps are locate, so you find the muscle, you find the lesion where you want to work on, then you shorten, so you place that muscle in a shortened position. 
and then either actively, well, then you apply your tension, either proximal to distal or distal to proximal, along the fibers of the muscle, and then uh, either passively or actively, the patient will then go into that stretch position. So if we do pectoralis major, um, we've got two heads that we're gonna primarily focus on, clavicular head and sternal head. So what I'm gonna have you do is you're gonna start by in this position, your arm just up here. When I tell you to, you're gonna bring your arm out into an external rotation. So we know that the uh, pectoralis major does horizontal adduction, internal rotation, so we're gonna wanna bring that arm into horizontal abduction and external rotation, just like that, okay? So what we're gonna do is find the muscle. This isn't a very difficult muscle to find. So I'm gonna create a tension with my thumb. Again, first you would, like with the strumming technique, find out where you feel those bands, where you feel the tension. I'm gonna come right in here. And then I'm gonna apply my force, proximal, so towards the, from the intertubercular group of the humerus, distal, out towards its insertion. I can come in, support with my other hand, PNR or hypopenar eminence. So what I want you to do now is abduct your arm into an external rotated position. Bring it in. For the first couple times, I'll probably guide him just to make sure that he's doing the motion right. So I want to here. Bring it out. Some people that you do like ART with, um, they're just, they'll want to avoid the, uh, the motions. They're going to want to avoid the stretch. The body always wants to you know, go into the position that's most comfortable. So a person might come out here and just do this. You really want to get that extra rotation. As you can see, my thumb isn't moving. I'm not using deep prep or anything like that. I've identified the area where I feel that there's some tightness. I create my proximal to distal tension. I'm at the level of the tissue, and I just maintain contact as we bring it out. Breathe out. So that's pectoralis major toward the clavicular head, sternal head. I'm going to come right off the sternum, and now my pressure is going to be medial to lateral, just like that. So we'll get the hand out of the way. Medial to lateral. Shorten the muscle and bring it out. Okay, that's pectoralis major. Pectoralis minor is a real fun one to do. Um, great technique in ART to do the pec minor. Pec minor comes off of where? Coracoid process. So now internal, external rotation of the shoulder, is that as important anymore? No, to shorten and then fully lengthen the muscle, we're gonna be using, uh, we're gonna be using the arm, but primarily to guide the uh, position of the scapula. So I'm gonna come down here, Okay, my thumb is going to find coracoid process right here. Right there it is. And then I'm going to bring my thumb on top of the coracoid process to bump off. You never want to apply pressure right onto the uh, uh, tendon insertion onto the bone. You want to come right off, slide off, and now I'm going to apply tension proximal to distal. I want to get through the pec major. If I'm just on here and I start doing this, I'm still on the pec major. So it's all about getting through the pec major. And now my tension is along the fibers. The pectoralis minor goes medially, in like that. <coughs> so what do I do to shorten it? I'm gonna bring the arm up into a position of scapular protraction. I'm gonna apply my tension. And now I'm gonna Bring the arm up and pull your shoulder blades together. Squeeze them together tight. And relax. Now, that's all they do in ART, but there's something else that we can do to shorten and lengthen the uh, pec minor that we know through uh, cardiopulm. What can we do to get more of a stretch out? Breathe in during the stretching or breathe out during the stretching? Breathe out. Yeah. Right, it shortens during. So what I'm going to have to do is take a deep breath in first. And I shorten and deep breath out. And now squeeze your shoulder blades together. Keep breathing out. And relax. Again, deep 
breath in, deep breath out, squeeze your shoulder blades together, and relax. One more way to get to pectoralis minor, real important to do pec minor. Also, you've got the uh, medial pectoral nerve coming through the pec minor, going to the pec major. If you find atrophy, weakness of pec major, that's one thing you want to rule out, is uh, tightness of the pec minor. So another way is coming under pec major. Take the pec major out of the way. I, here's his uh, coracoid process, so I go up, Find pec minor right against the chest wall, and now I apply tension along his fibers. And once again, deep breath in, <coughs> and deep breath out, shoulder blades together. Just like that. If you want to inside, I really couldn't appreciate what you're doing. So, regular pec minor move. Hold the arm, coracoid process, slip off, shorten the muscle, relax, I got you, relax. Feel it real well here, feel that. Create tension, shoulder blades squeeze them together, and breathe out, 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 out. Okay? Uh, ART, do three to five passes, just like that, and then find uh, kind of the next lesion. Going under the pec major, I right under here. Take the pec major out of the way. Go underneath towards his coracoid process. Underneath that I find his chest wall. And now again I shorten, apply my tension medially. Shoulder blades squeeze them together. Breathe out. Um, so that's pec major, pec minor. One last move I'll show you along with serratus anterior, subscap, uh, lat. This is a great technique you can do. You're gonna, let me do it over here. You're gonna uh, bring your hand right into this position. So from here you have access to pec major, you have access to pec minor underneath, you have access to the lats, and you have access to the serratus anterior and subscap. You can do a lot over here. And the motion that we're going to do is he's going to bring his arm up into this position, which is going to put a stretch onto the lat, stretch onto the pec major, um, real good position, even get a little bit of a stretch going towards the serratus. And then depending on where I find a lot of tension, again, you kind of listen with your hand, you apply your forces. So I can go either against the lat, this way, so that's the tightness in the lat, or I can go pec major, more along here. Subscapularis. Or serratus anterior, it's a good uh, way to do it is with a broad contact. Doing all right? <coughs> Any questions with that? Anything on that other muscle we're becoming very fond of? Transversus thoracis. They didn't have a specific uh, uh, move for transversus thoracis, but uh, but I figure they have they have it where you they they do techniques for the diaphragm, and so we would uh, put the diaphragm first on maximal, uh, you know, getting it real short. So I would have to take a deep deep breath in, and instead of um, creating a force. Uh, in and laterally. Um, I was thinking you could create a force in immediately kind of scooping up underneath. And I, I don't know if this makes any sense, but we can try. Cross your arms, cross your chest. I was messing around with this. This is not new techniques at all. This is new. So once again, I'm in here on the upper, uh, the costal margin. And we're gonna take a deep breath in. I scoop up underneath and breathe out, bringing it to extension. Perhaps even using a towel to get some more thoracic extension as we come back. Transversus thoracic. So again, it shortens in more thoracic flexion. Deep breath in. No 
no evidence to support that, but no. I thought, uh, how, how would I apply ART to that muscle? That's, that's kind of what I came up with. That's what techniques develop, and someone does a study on it and comes up with some science. The art's usually way ahead of the science. Okay, let me just say thanks so much. Uh, the uh, framing of the scapula, and then we'll practice this at home. On your side towards the uh, side. I don't know if we did this in massage or not. Sometimes we don't get to it. Can we do this one? Framing of the scapula. <laughs> So again, we're working on this person who is round-shouldered, protracted shoulder girdle, chest sternum, forward head. We're trying to get this person from up and forward to eventually down and back, to get the thoracic spine mobilized out of the way, and then we train the lower trap. So this is good to get the shoulders down and back. I find the barrier. I don't know if it's going to be in depression or retraction or a combination. But I look for the area that's somewhat tight, and then I start to rake, like the garden rake, through the upper trap and the levator. And as it frees up through the levator and upper trap, the shoulder girl starts to come down, down and back. So it's up and forward, we want to go down and back. Maybe in some people it's more retraction, others it's more depression. You never know until you're there. And then we switch, phase two. I come in with this hand. Again, I look for the, the area that's most restricted. And I come in here on the medial border of the scapula and I start to upwardly rotate. So think about what I'm stretching here. I'm depressing, I'm adducting, and now I'm upwardly rotating. So what am I getting a nice stretch on? Levator scap, which is an elevator and a downward rotator. So I'm getting depression and upward rotating. So a nice levator scap stretch. Also, Trap, also, pec minor. Now for the pec minor, we add a little bit of the um, posterior tilt. So I ask for an isometric contraction for an anterior tilt. I'm on the bottom of the scapula with one hand, top with the other. Now push into my top hand. That's it. Now it's anteriorly tilting, bringing in the pec minor, relax, and then I posteriorly tilt it, upwardly rotate it. Okay? Got a nice release of all this tissue into here. Then I just come in here and I free up everything in the scapula of the thoracic area that can be freed up. All right, so we start here, phase one, find the barrier, rake through, and then switch, find the barrier, and then turn the wheel, and then tilt. Scapular fashion, free all this area up, anterior, superior, and posterior. Then next time we'll start with um, the patient who's got a flat thoracic with weak serratus who can't flex. Then we'll free up all this posterior tissue. That'll be a little different approach for that patient. Basically three types of patients you see. You see the um, rounded shoulders, forward head. You see the uh, flat thoracic spine, forward head. And you see the, the patient with scoliosis. You got to think about stretching the concave side to get them elongating on that side. Now, why would um, both the patient with an increased kyphosis, who's got the protracted shoulder girdle, why does that person have forward head? And why does the person with the flat thoracic spine also have the forward head? If the thoracic spine is doing something different, why do they both have forward head posture? We know why the person with the rounded shoulders has forward head, right? Because the lower neck follows the upper thoracic. And then to keep the eyes at eye level, the head extends. Why does the person who's got a flat thoracic spine have forward head? Maybe compensation. Compensation for what? Lack of flexion. Yeah, you're on the right track. Is your center of like, gravity? Center of gravity, right? So the gravity is posterior, so this balances it. Yeah? It's a balancing mechanism, I think. Good. Okay, so 